speaker tonight is an intelligent and highly regarded preacher in this Ohio Valley and throughout the Brotherhood. Charles Pugh spoke to us this morning, and he will speak to us again in a continuation of studying Romans chapter 1. He has preached the gospel for over 51 years. He is on the faculty at the West Virginia School of Preaching and is one of its founders. We appreciate his work, and we'll turn things over to him at this time. In the opening words of his acceptance speech, for the Templeton Prize, which is awarded to someone who has made some significant contribution internationally in the field of religion. In 1993, that award was given to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the late Russian novelist and short story writer, who lived from 1918 to 2008. Solzhenitsyn, in his acceptance speech for that prestigious award, summed up what I believe can be set forth as a basic proposition that is implied in the first chapter of the book of Romans, and he said this, and I quote, More than half a century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of older people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had fallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this happened. As Solzhenitsyn said about his people's demise, I believe Paul implies about every nation of men all this has happened because men have forgotten God. That is a fundamental premise in verses 18 through 32 of the first chapter of Romans. It has been called by some perhaps the saddest commentary upon the lives and the characters of men which can be found in all of literature. It was written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, concerning, number one, man's alienation uh, of his mind and his life from God. Number two, the revelation of God's wrath upon man as a result of that. And number three, the affirmation of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the power of God unto salvation. From the opening verse unto the final paragraph, the book of Romans is ultimately about the gospel of God, chapter 1 and verse 1, or as Paul intimately calls it, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, Romans 16 and 26. This first chapter of Romans can be called, in a real sense, a pivotal chapter in the Bible, not only in view of the remainder of Romans, but I suggest to you also in view of the rest of the Bible before and after Romans. In a crucial sense, this chapter is one of the most pivotal chapters in the Bible. The 15 verses of this latter half of the first chapter of Romans would establish in conjunction with chapters 2 and 3 why it is the case that humanity needs the gospel of Christ. That's what's happening here in these verses. These verses also imply, however, an additional matter that is often overlooked but it is extremely important and crucial to the human situation. I want to think with you here at this point about a speech, a speech that used to be studied, as I've read about it, in our school system quite frequently, even by young children. It was by President George Washington. This speech was delivered September the 19th, 1796. It is identified as his farewell address. And Washington in that speech spoke of these things. Listen carefully. 
indispensable supports, great pillars of human happiness, the firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. And then he asked the question, who that is a sincere friend to free government can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric. Long before Washington addressed what he called the foundation of the fabric of civilization and of society, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Rome with a beginning, among other things, a beginning that implies with ultimate authority and clarity the true foundation of the fabric of human existence. And that foundation is God. This remarkable first chapter of Romans implies how foundational this knowledge of God is to creation. According to Paul, knowing God, invisible and possessing eternal power and divine nature, knowing that God actually exists, is foundational to what every accountable human being can and should know. Listen to Paul in verses 19 and 20. He says, What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, or His divine nature, so that they are without excuse." God is the ultimate reality, and every accountable human being is confronted with the evidence for God through one's own inner self, with our consciousness, with our memory, with our rationality, with our conscience, that sense of ultimate, absolute good, with one's own body being contingent and manifesting design. And then as we look out, other minds, the physical universe, which itself is contingent and is manifesting design, and numerous additional constituent elements. All of this composes what we can rightly call the one conglomerate argument for the existence of God. The total evidence of this warrants this deduction. And when properly deduced from a natural or a general revelation in creation, in man, this is not merely, my friends, a conclusion that is probably or simply assumed to be the case. The force of this, according to Paul in the first chapter of Romans, is such that one is without excuse excuse if he does not embrace the existence of God. Paul says, however, men became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened, verse 21. The word foolish here, our English word, comes from a Greek word in this text that has its roots in the idea, the idea that means they were not able, in a sense, to put together the manifest evidence about God. They had the ability, but they did not exercise that ability properly. This is being rational. Rationality, my friends, entails putting together facts and information and evidence and drawing conclusions that are in harmony with what those facts demand. It is, if you please, an adding up, a collecting together 
of this information and drawing the right conclusion. And in this context, that conclusion is that God is. The fact is the negation of God uh, from the human mind or in the human mind is the result of irrationality in the sense, and this is what I mean by being irrational uh, in this context, in the sense of failing to honor the principle of following the evidence where it leads one, which we often refer to as the law of rationality. Christian theism, what Christianity teaches about these things, is in harmony with that principle. I have in these notes this evening passage after passage after passage that time will not permit for us to look at. But I would urge you to go through your Bible and just notice these kinds of things. Let me just give you an example or two. Luke 1, 1 to 4, and John 20, 30 and 31. The sermon that Peter preached on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of our Lord, which he was just setting forth line of evidence upon line of evidence upon line of evidence and drawing the conclusion, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you've crucified both Lord and Christ, Acts 2, 22 through 36. Even the opening as Brother Emmanuel so wonderfully set before us today in his introduction to the book of Romans, the first four verses of Romans chapter 1 would imply this sort of thing. 1 Corinthians 15, that marvelous chapter, that great resurrection chapter, read carefully verses like verses 1 through 19, of course the entire chapter for that matter. But you see the kind of thing that I'm talking about here if you'll pay close attention to these things. And the succinct and very brief statement of Paul when he writes to the Thessalonians, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And on and on. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews 3 and verse 4, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Passage after passage after passage. One of my favorites is the response of Paul to Festus in Acts chapter 26 when Paul was presenting the gospel to King Agrippa and he was making what is called there his defense as to why he became a Christian. And he was interrupted by Festus who said, you're out of your mind. Your much learning has made you go out of your mind. And he says very, very respectfully. He responds to Festus as most noble Festus. And he said, I am not out of my mind, but I am speaking true and rational words. Acts 26 and verse 25. And the word used by Paul here that is translated rational uh, in the English Standard Version, soberness in the King James and the American Standard Versions, reason in the New King James Version, and sober truth in the New American Standard Version means what is intellectually sound. And what is intellectually sound is that which has the evidence to back it up. In addition to this basic foundation of God, and then in turn reasoning to God through the process of fitting together the available information and evidence, there is a third pillar of human existence that is implied in this great biblical passage here in Romans chapter 1 at verse 26. When Paul describes those who have changed the natural use into that which is against nature. I believe it is with great significance that this foundation is implied in one of the most foundational documents of the United States of America the Declaration of Independence. In its very first sentence, it makes reference to, quote, the laws of nature and nature's God. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, explained the meaning of this phrase. Adams said, and I quote, the laws of nature and nature's God, of course, presuppose the existence of a God the moral ruler of the universe and a rule of right and wrong, of just and unjust, now watch this, binding upon men, preceding all institutions of human society and of government. 
the moral law to which he refers is itself a element in the natural order of human existence and it implies that morality is foundational to human civilization. There was a late British diplomat by the name of Sir John Glubb. He was a military commander, a very prolific author of books, chiefly on the Middle East. He wrote an unusual book titled The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival. And in this book, Glubb tells about his study of what he called empires or superpower nations. And he studied these for about a period of 3,000 years going back. And his conclusion was that all of these empires, all of these superpower nations in human history during this period began with the following. The age of the pioneers, followed by the ages of conquest, commerce, affluence, intellect, and then decadence. And Glubb says the final stage, decadence. And the final characteristics of this stage, a weakening of religion, involved moral and spiritual disease. He summarizes the essential connection between religion and morality in human flourishing. And he says this, and I quote, decadence is a moral and a spiritual disease. It has been shown, he goes on to say, that normally the rise and the fall of great nations are due to internal reasons alone. Politicians, he says, are unwilling often or afraid to admit our decline is due to a loss of moral fiber. But this writer goes on to say, I am convinced that moral standards can only be raised by a revival of religion. And of course, you and I would affirm the revival of the true religion. And that is the gospel of Christ today. And people to see the need for that and to apply it to their lives. Again, Paul says it best in Romans 1, 18 through 32, making it clear that the irrational denial of God's existence made known from creation results in a denial of what is seen clearly from the natural order. The denial of the truth, metaphysically, which simply means beyond the physical. The denial of that, and of course God is beyond the physical. And the, the denial of rationality and the denial of the natural order of things results in the denial of absolute moral truth. And Romans sets forth here the foundational element in connection with all of this, the monogamous uh, heterosexual marriage in conjunction with the total context of biblical teaching, which we, of course, would have passages like what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 19 and what we read all the way back at the beginning in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But listen to Paul in these verses, Romans 1, 24 through 27. Therefore... God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God. Here it is again. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, Paul says, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one for another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. That's Romans 1, 24 through 27. Compare that also in the context of addressing biblical teaching on marriage with what Paul says later in a different context in Romans chapter 7 and verses 1 through 3. Again, just how remarkably relevant this section of Scripture is, which causes me to affirm that it's so pivotal 
and how in harmony it is with reality should be obvious to those who recognize truth, reality, and recognize what the Bible teaches. There was a book that was done in 2015 titled The Thriving Society, subtitled On the Social Conditions of Human Flourishing. And it uh, contains several essays on things that contribute, they say, to what can help a decent society to survive and thrive. And one of the very first essays is titled The Family as First Building Block. And it was written, this essay, essay written by a professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. And among other things, he says this, social scientists of the family, until fairly recently, noted the comparative stability and social benefits of the two parent opposite sex married household. He then goes on to say, or ask, can marriage be comprised of two men or two women? And he answers, few believe so prior to 30 years ago. The book was published in 2015, so take it back 30 years, 1985, literally, that's what it would be. And he goes on to say, only in the past 10 years, catch this, has majority opinion in European countries asserted so. That would take it back to about 2005. This isn't preacher talk. This isn't even some theologian. This is a sociology professor at one of the highest levels of academia in our nation. He says, few question that the family is important for human flourishing. However, the cultural turning away from the biological family in the academy, that's the academic institutions, and in the legal community, that's the courts, is remarkable. And he says this, the evidence for its strength is incontrovertible. And the cost in its absence is obvious, but it is increasingly politically unpalatable to go to bat for this family. When civilization, when human existence experiences this ongoing disconnect with proper foundations, as we began with theologically, rationally, naturally, morally, and sexually. The result will be social chaos. The loss of God in the mind, folks, will result and play out in the loss of God in life, and it affects not only the individual, it affects society as a whole. Listen to Paul, Romans 1.28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do, to do what ought not to be done. John Stott, in his commentary on this, sums it up, I think, well. He sets forth a catalog of 21 sins mentioned here in these verses, beginning with every kind of wickedness, and evil and greed and maliciousness and then progressing envy and murder and strife and deceit and malignity or malice and then libel and slander and these are followed by those who hate God and insolent and arrogant and boastful and then another couple of words denoting those who are inventor, inventors of evil things and rebellious or disobedient to parental authority. And the list ends with without understanding and covenant breakers and without natural affection and unmerciful. G. Campbell Morgan sums up how the implication of the loss of a sufficient attachment to the true foundations of human existence play out in society. And he said this, quote, the measure 
in which any people neglect the sacred means which express divine relationship is the, me the measure which sooner or later they violate the principles of social relationship. When we aren't right this way, it's going to affect us this way. And we see it. We see it in our own country, before our very eyes, unraveling from the rising tide of all sorts of terrorism, racially motivated hatred and violence, mass shootings, secularism that has resulted in a degenerating decadence, vitriol that spews forth from various media, rancor that characterizes political campaigns, talk shows, reality TV, and street protests, epidemic litigation, and on and on and on. The book of Proverbs affirms the New King James reading of it, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no revelation, the people run wild. You see, even with all of these, these foundational principles that I've set before you, that you can see them coming out, the implications here in Romans 1, even with these, you see, society is lacking. And the reason? No one of us perfectly lives up to the evidence that he or she has. Even among the very best, there is no one that is one who is accountable for his or her thoughts and actions. There is none of us who live in perfect harmony with that, with the content that we see within our very existence the demands the existence of God that we see outside of ourselves and furthermore the content manifested through these principles that we've alluded to the rationality the foundation of God the morality the natural order all of this you see within those things themselves there is not sufficient information to entitle us, to enable us, to answer the greatest questions of life. But Christianity does that. The Bible does that. The 66 books of the biblical revelation make the claim that here we have the complete and the final revelation of God to man. And there's numerous passages in the Bible like this. Some of them are so obvious. How people miss this. When you have a claim like Paul makes in writing to Timothy when he said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And you can even cross-reference the passages even, even in his writing to Timothy again in another place. And he calls the writings of Luke Scripture. And that these things, he's not just talking about what he wrote. He's talking about inspiration through those that Peter identifies as holy men of God and the origin of these things being God through the Holy Spirit. And the Bible provides us then the kinds of information, the kind of information we need to back that claim up. Emmanuel dealt this morning with one of the most obvious ones. And that is prophecy made and fulfilled. We likely need, my fellow gospel preachers, to get back to preaching more, if we're not doing it, to get back to preaching more on these great prophetic passages. And some of them so obvious. Surely, when you have people that will be honest, I believe as he alluded to this morning, surely, when they see this, they'll see who the fulfillment of it is, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who said, in conjunction with all this, upon this rock, His identity, He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. There is a sense in which the history of our Western civilization itself, when properly studied, in conjunction, of course, with biblical content, 
establishes clearly the case that the Bible is an element that is beyond all others in the foundation of human existence. In the syntopic and the great books of the Western world, the Bible is described in this way, quote, one book, one book stands out from all the rest because it is, as the use of Bible for its proper name implies, the book about God and man. And that source goes on to say and describe the Bible as having, quote, unparalleled influence upon Western culture. You see, the heart, the heart of all of this is the Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life. And there are attacks being unleashed daily before our very eyes on this not the least of which are attacks coming from Hollywood to Washington, D.C., to high-level campuses of academia, health care agencies, even churches, shopping malls, school rooms, living rooms, and numerous other places in hometown USA. Folks, Christian values will not survive, will not survive in a culture that rejects the divine foundation of these values, Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32. The psalmist said, if the foundations, listen carefully, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11, verse 3. And I want to emphasize that we must remember that there is a sense in which all of these elements that are foundational to what human life on earth is truly about can never be destroyed in one sense. We can ignore them. They can be forsaken by man here on earth. But as the psalmist wrote in another place in Psalm 119 and verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The greatest person in the history of this world. Not just a great person, but the very Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13 8, has delivered the absolute truth about the foundations of life theologically, rationally, naturally, morally, heterosexually, socially, and biblically through His person, His Word, and His work. And ultimately, beyond all that exists in the world for the benefit of man, our Lord has, by His appearing, revealed His purpose and His grace given, Paul writes, given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And He has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 2 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10. What a foundation He provides us through the gospel. A foundation for our existence here on this earth. But the hope of immortality, the hope of the resurrection, and all that that entails, which we find here. Tonight, if you have not accessed in your life the benefits of this gospel, do that this evening. The greatest way to live is to live the Christian life here on this earth. But you see, it's not only having a promise of the life which now is, Paul says in another place, but of the life which is to come. Every one of us is going to face death at some time. We know not when. There is but a step between me and death, we read in Holy Scripture. Your life can change drastically in just a matter of moments. There is a sense from the moment that you lift your foot up and place it down, you can pass from this life into the, to the next. Are you ready? Tonight, obey the gospel. 
access the benefits of that, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, by rising and being baptized and having your sins washed away, calling on the name of the Lord. The blood of Christ will cleanse you as you're united with Him. Paul will tell us later in Romans, and there will be a lesson on this sometime during this week from Romans chapter 6. To be united with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Of course, all predicated upon your faith in Him and your repentance of sin and the confession of that faith, even as Paul mentions in Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you've done this and for some reason along the way, you've gotten sidetracked, you've been overcome by sin, you're not living in harmony with the commitment that you made when you obeyed the gospel. And that can happen to any one of us at any time. But we need to acknowledge that. And we need to repent. And as the prodigal did, come back home. And good brethren will pray with you and help you and encourage you. As you get a new start again, as a child of God, having already obeyed the gospel, but needing to get back and walking faithful with the Lord. You come if you need to tonight while together we stand and we sing.